This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello, and welcome to the Friday Twilight Show. I'm Claire Cannon, and whether you are listening live or have downloaded the podcast, thank you for joining me. Year 6 to 7 is talked about quite a lot, but it is much less common to look at in-school transition. Yet I believe this is something that's really important to consider, which is just what I'll do today. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Thank you again for joining me today on the Friday Twilight Show. Um, In this show, I'm thinking about an area of school life which I don't think is given as much of a spotlight uh, as other areas. Um, Yet it's something that for me, um, and I think for our students and for staff, is just as crucial. Um, What I'm thinking about here is in-school transition. Um, We talk a lot about transition from year six to year seven. And actually, it's, it is actually what I covered in my previous show two weeks ago. But I don't think we give as much focus to or on the students who are transitioning within our setting. So, for example, um, year three to year four in a primary school, year eight to nine, 10 to 11. Um, it's almost seen as, well, they're in the school and they, they know what we're about. They know how it works. And therefore, you know, there might be a little bit of transition support, perhaps perhaps on a day or a half a day, but we certainly don't put as much emphasis on supporting those changes within our schools um, compared to what we do when we're thinking about students moving from one setting to another, which, you know, those, I completely get that. It makes sense when you move from primary to secondary. And I like to always make sure, you know, our three tier colleagues, lower, middle and upper school, you know, those changes that are taking place, you know, quite rightly, when there are big changes happening, the students moving from one school to another, yes, of course, it's important to support that change. But I think if we did more to support transition within our own setting, um, that we would actually, you know, it's not one, one magic wand, I don't think there is one quick fix, but I think it would go a long way to addressing some of the issues that are quite commonly seen um you know in september but also as the students move through the academic year um i can see i've got emma already signed in and hello tom as well i can see you there um i am really looking forward to talking to emma lee Curl later in the show um i'll leave emma to introduce herself a little bit more um in a short while but emma is someone who has vast experience 20 years over 20 years experience um, in education, and is head of learning support um, and a SENCO in a school which is a little bit different um, to perhaps most people's setting. But as I say, I will leave her to introduce herself in a little while and tell us a little bit more about what she does, her role, and her thoughts around in school transition. So, um, before Emma joins us, I just wanted to have a little bit of a think about why it is that we need to support these transitions. Now, if you listen to the show that I did two weeks ago, um, which was the focus on the primary to secondary transition, we did talk about the reasons why change can be tough and how to think about some of the things that we can do to support and the reasons why we need to put that support in place. And just just for those of you who perhaps didn't get the chance to listen to that show, which is absolutely fine, everyone's got busy lives to lead, Um, We talked about sameness and routine and the fact that, you know, although there are changes that will always happen, we can always find elements of things that, you know, routines, things that are going to stay the same, things that are going to be predictable that can help us to feel that little bit more safe and hopefully reduce some anxiety. That might be things like at a primary school, you know, the same teacher is going to be on the gate or the same teacher is going to be on the playground. Um, secondary school, I'm thinking of a particular student here, 
um, who always liked to go and get their bacon roll from the canteen in the morning. That was their routine. Didn't matter, you know, from year seven right through, that was their routine. It was just something that helped helped them kind of set up for the day in more ways than one. Um, the other thing about keeping that element of routine and sameness is that it reduces our cognitive load. We're not having to think about what is happening now or what might happen next. Um, we're not having to think, oh, you know, am I going to have to adjust something I'm doing or, you know, just, just taking up that bandwidth with wondering um, what it might be that's around the corner. So linking there to safety. Um, we've talked about um, in the previous show, again, fear of the unknown. Um, lots of change brings lots of uncertainty, particularly when we think about our students who have got special educational needs. Could be any number of things. Could be something to do with diagnosis such as autism or ADHD. Perhaps they've experienced trauma. But, you know, for all sorts of reasons, they are hypervigilant around change. They are already anxious. And actually what that does is it means they are less able to process other information that has been given to them. So then that kind of creates this cycle where they become more anxious because they know they've missed out some key information. They perhaps have some issues around asking for help. They don't know how that's going to be perceived. So you can see how that kind of creates a situation that just can get worse and worse rather than getting any better. Um, and actually, if we're thinking about students who have got backgrounds where unfortunately they have experienced trauma, or perhaps it's ongoing, sadly, you know, there can be real issues around attachment. It might be, you know, they've got a key member of staff that they're worried they're going to lose access to, or they're not going to be able to see them at the same time anymore. It can also be little things, you know, to a lot of people, what seem little things like getting a new locker, or am I going to get a new locker? Um, where am I going to put my school bag um, when I arrive in the next year group? So, you know, that that's just a flavour of some of the things that might be going on. There will be a whole lot more, I'm sure, um, that Emma will, I'm hoping she will have some ideas on that one. Because, you know, why don't we do more around in-school transition? You know, there is so much to it actually going on that if we put some more resources in, it's that kind of catching things early, catch them when we've got a chance to put things in place, to put strategies there that will support the students. So actually, when they do go into that next year group from year three to four or seven to eight, whatever it is, they know a little bit more about what to expect, just like you would do when they move from primary to secondary. So other ideas, there's there's plenty more to think about. I'm going to just touch on a few in a few minutes time. Um, after we have a quick break to hear from our sponsor. Reading Solutions UK. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Join the free online international reading conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of June. Hear from speakers like TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui. Beloved children's author Michael Rosen, fluency expert Tim Rosinski, EEF specialist Chloe Butlin, the National Literacy Trust's Irene Picton, and a range of experienced practitioners, including MAT leaders, deputy heads, heads of English, high level teaching assistants, and school librarians. Through the three-day conference, speakers will explore a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape, with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Visit Reading Solutions at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk for more information and to sign up for this free conference. Okay, good to hear about the reading conference there. Definitely something that is always going to be a priority is reading and literacy standards of our students and interesting speakers lined up as well. So um, in the show today, I'm thinking about transition within the same school. Um, so going to share a few thoughts now on the sorts of things that might support our students. So 
Um, if you're listening live and you have any ideas or comments, we'd love to hear from you. So please do text in. It'd be good to see what you think. Um, so, you know, I am going to say, actually, first of all, there are obviously schools that do do a lot already to support transition with this within their school, within their setting. However, it's just one of those things that's not always, you know, everybody's priority. It's not always given that same focus as other types of transition. So, you know, some things that I do hear and do see, I'm very fortunate I get to work with lots of different schools in my role at the moment. So move up day can be called different things, but essentially where students go from, you know, if they are year three, they go and spend a day being year four. So they meet their new teacher. Um, and the same, you know, for older students in secondary school, they will go and meet their new, you know, key worker, their new head of year, whatever the setup is, perhaps pastoral team, do a day in the life, those kind of timetable things, practical things, um, so they can see what might happen. It's not always a whole day. Um, I know some schools perhaps, you know, will do a half a day or will have some kind of different um, arrangement. But what they are doing is providing that opportunity for students to have a little bit of a taste of what is to come. And that might include other things such as assemblies, uh, particularly before the end of term, kind of setting up expectations for the new year, bit of a quick, you know, hello, how are you, checking in, um, and then something that will kind of almost lead on from that at the start of the next year as well. Um, another thing that I have seen, and this is perhaps more secondary schools, but doesn't have to be, is that some students, particularly those with SND, are given a copy of their new timetable. Um, just so they can see some of the rooms, some of the teachers, and, and the intention behind that is obviously so that, that student is prepared for, you know, instead of having PE their maths on a Monday morning, I've now got English and then science. So they know what to expect. And I, you know, completely get the logic behind that. I think it's really good um, that those students are given those opportunities and that information. Um, I have to say it was harder to think of as many examples that are done uh, in school transition compared to the year six, seven show from before. And something, again, picking up on that show was around relationships. Um, and that's not just for the pupils, that's for the staff, that's for the families. You know, this is a, a joined up approach in terms of what I think would be really beneficial for making this transition within school feel better for for everybody um, and ultimately what we want is the impact on student outcomes so how can we put things in place what can we do that are going to build those relationships that are also going to manage expectations because we all know that when people get their hopes up or they you know are predicting one thing and then something else actually happens that can really easily become a source of frustration. It can become a source of conflict even. And absolutely the last thing anybody wants at the beginning of term when you're trying to get things off to a good start is having to deal with conflict from the word go. So how can you do this? What can we put into place? Families, let's pick up on families. We talk a lot about the students, but the families are important. And when I say family, you know, obviously recognising that some people don't have your typical family I'm referring to any adults you know carers people that you know look after and have responsibility for those young people day to day when they're not in school so meet the teacher events similar way actually to the primary secondary transition but you know could schools perhaps do more to support parents to get to know their child's new teacher class teacher you know primary school or secondary school there I think equally as applicable um, something I did see the other day, actually, when I was reading a little bit around this topic in preparation for the show, is that some schools now are doing a quick sort of email intro, so a little bit of a, a bio almost about the teacher. And that's not, not to say they're oversharing. It's just a little hello, um, you know, this is me. If your school is one that shares contact details, it might have email address on there. Um, and, you know, a little fun fact about the teacher, which obviously they're happy um, to share. They've got to be OK with that information. But, you know, if it was me, it'd be something like, you know, I'm Blair, I'm a science teacher and I have two Springer Spaniels. So it's nothing, um, nothing too personal, but it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's humanising people. It's making that connection. So that I thought that was a really nice way 
of just doing something that's hopefully not too difficult as well. There's not a big cost implication, but it would be supportive for families and students. Um, what about celebration assemblies? And again, thinking about cost, thinking about time, thinking about resources, which are always going to be stretched in schools. Um, you know, how can you use what you've already got and perhaps improve it in some way, perhaps do something slightly different? So those celebration assemblies, if you've got, you know, key stage one parents coming in, for example, you know, could the key stage two staff be there? Um, and even if it's just almost like a name drop at the end and say, oh, by the way, we've got, you know, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so here with us today. They are, you know, the key stage two team. So you're just kind of drip feeding who these people are, what their roles are. And um, so you are, again, building those connections and helping people to see that, you know, they're, they're a familiar face. They're somebody that I recognize. There's somebody that I, I feel like I can have a conversation with. Um, what about strategies? You know, they, they were sort of family things. What about the students? Because, you know, they are obviously the ones that we see day to day in our schools. So what I've done is again, having a little bit of a read around a few ideas of my own as well. Um, primary schools, um, I say grouped these broadly by age, primary and secondary, but that doesn't mean they have to be, um, you know, only for those age groups. But primary students, could they have an extra session where they meet the staff? Could they go and see their teacher for an extra period of time? Could they do something fun together. We know that shared positive memories are a really good way, not just of building that initial connection, but helping to grow that connection moving on. Um, again, uh, that could actually apply equally to secondary, although I have put it in my sort of little list of things that are primary. Could they, your primary students, could they, when they go and see that new classroom, does it have to be at the same time as everybody else? Could they perhaps go a little bit before? Do they need to know, for example, where they're going to sit? If there's like the carpet time, do you have little tiles? I know some some schools have little spots or tiles um, that the students will sit on. And do they perhaps need to know where their, their place is going to be? Do they need to know where they hang their coat up because it's different to their current room? All of those little things that can easily be missed, but it's the little things that make that big difference. Um, Leanne, actually, Leanne Lax, who's part of the Teachers Talk Radio team, very kindly sent me a couple of suggestions when she knew that I was doing this show. And she said, from reception to year one is a massive transition and she felt that you know there's lots that could be done there so they go from a setting where they're predominantly play-based and sometimes in year one it's straight to sitting at a desk you know perhaps there could be more done at the end of reception to bridge that gap and perhaps the beginning of year one doesn't have to be straight into here's your chair here's your table let's get on with your work um, and I liked her suggestion as well of choosing, because when they're doing that play-based activity, they have a lot more choice over what they do, how they do it. Um, so could, for example, when they've got maths, pick from a range of activities that still get them towards whatever the objective is for that lesson. So I just want to say thank you to Leanne, because although she's not here joining us this evening, it was really kind of her to share some of those thoughts. So secondary, let's have a quick think. Um, about secondary school so again perhaps that meeting the staff that I mentioned earlier on um, and picking up on the idea of the timetable so if they have been given their new timetable is it enough to assume that they're then okay I'm not sure it is um, I've got actually an, an example that hopefully illustrates this so big secondary school that I worked in had a permanent role there loved that school um, they had a tower block and it was numbered a little bit like a hotel. So if you were on first floor, all of the rooms started with a one. So it went up to 19 and then second floor, you know, two up to 29. And there was a year seven. It was within one of the first couple of weeks that term started. So lots of staff out and about helping the year sevens find their way around. And a student stopped me and he said to me, "Where? how do I find room, whatever, 27? And I said to him, well, the two means you've got to go up to floor two. And the year 11, so been there since year seven, year 11 walked past and went, what did you just say, miss? 
And so I repeated that same thing, you know, two is, and they said, I never knew that. I never realised, I just wandered along the corridor till I went, oh, that's not on this floor, and I'd go up to the next one, wander along, and keep going. Now, bearing in mind this block was three or four storeys high, that student must have done a lot of wandering in their, their time since year seven. So, you know, it's important that we don't assume that students know where to go just because they've been in a school for a year. So point being, you know, yes, you've given them their new timetable. That's brilliant. But have they actually been given the opportunity to ask questions, to find out where some of those rooms are and perhaps to meet some of those teachers that they, you know, in a big secondary school, again, in particular, might never have seen before. Obviously, there's going to be the odd teacher that perhaps hasn't started work at the school yet. I think everybody can you know, appreciate there are certain things we just can't get around, but we can do a lot more, I think, than we do. Um, going back to that idea of question and answer, you know, again, might be something, and I think this is particularly true year nine to ten. So if they're a, a school that, you know, do wait till year ten to start their GCSEs, are there going to be significant changes to that young person's timetable? quite likely because they've gone from you know doing all of the different subjects to having the ones they've chosen and again I think it's very easy to assume that because students have chosen those subjects that everything's going to be okay with their timetable and you know my experience would definitely be that's not always the case and they do need time to kind of process those changes so where might they feel comfortable having that conversation who might they feel comfortable with let's get some of those discussions opened up and you know up front before they arrive in September anyway um, that's quite a few ideas for me there I said I was just going to give you a flavor and actually I've carried on chatting away um, hopefully not to myself but there we go um, Emma I can see you are there so I'm going to invite you in to join us if that is okay hopefully you'll be able to get your um, microphone and everything working and we'll be able to hear you nice and clearly I can see you are just about to come in as a speaker which is fantastic um if you missed me introducing emma earlier on i was just saying about how she's very very experienced professional Tw over 20 years um working in education and currently head of learning support and co emma Hello. Fab <laughs> fabulous to have you here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, it's a pleasure. Total pleasure. Um, I always think on a Friday, you know, I, I invite people to come and I'm very mindful that it's, you know, 6 p.m. And you've just <laughs> finished and not just finished a week of work, just finished half term as well. So we an have. Extra thank you. <laughs> yes, no, it's a pleasure. Do you want to just do a, a little bit more of an introduction than I've done so that our yeah, listeners absolutely. know a little bit about you? So my name's Emily Carroll and I work in a prep school where I'm head of learning support and I'm also the SENCO. And the, the interesting thing about my role is I also work on in our senior school, which is on the same site. So okay. I do three days in our prep school and then I do two days in our senior school, which I think is actually quite an interesting role because it means I get to see the children from age three all the way up to 18. And I work with generally about year one to year two upwards to uh, anything up to year 12 and year 13. So it's it's really good to see and sort of gain knowledge about what comes after a certain key stage and what comes before a certain key stage. So I haven't met anybody else who does quite what I do. So I'm quite lucky in that respect, I think, really. No, I don't. I mean, I'm not the most experienced person in the world by any means, but I do get to go into lots of other schools now in my role. And I have to say, I've never met anybody yet um, other than yourself that has the breadth of not just age range, but how your role differs, because it's not the same, is it, what you do in the secondary school? Um, no, exactly. We have another sen a Senko. Part. Yeah, we have another Senko in our secondary school. So I work under her when I'm in the senior school. Yeah. And I guess, you know, when when I was thinking about this show and you messaged me and said I'd like to come and join you and I was like that's amazing because the perspective you will have on transition because you are seeing them through all of the different ages and the same student isn't it as well so you're yeah, absolutely you know, how, how they're reacting to change when they're perhaps seven or eight years old compared to when they're 15 16 
totally totally and it's also quite lucky because I teach um, I support the year six students and it means that uh, through transition I can then also continue to teach them when they're in year seven so it works really well for the pupils but it also works well for the parents because they're they're sort of reassured that they've got that that sort of friendly person who knows them and knows their child um, when they start secondary school so it's it's it sort of works for everybody I think really yeah and and you've got that I like the fact you picked up on the parents because we do do so much with the year six to seven transition. Um, and I suppose I wondered really, when I put that thought out there for people on social media saying, would anybody like to come and talk about transition with other year groups? Um, you know, what, what your thoughts are? Because I'd said, you know, this is around we'd, us not putting enough emphasis on that transition. Mm. So mm. I just wondered if that's something that does sort of resonate with you. It, I mean, it does. It's certainly an interesting thing to to think about because, like you say, as, as you mentioned, that we we do concentrate on those big transitions. You know, nursery into reception, key stage one into key stage two, key stage two into secondary, and then throughout those secondary years. And you're right, we we don't often sort of think about well, what about year three to four? What about five to six? What about seven to eight? It's it's those kind of things, and those can be just as anxiety inducing for for children and parents that I've I've yeah. worked with as well it's it's sometimes it's sometimes it's more the, the parent than it is the child actually because you know, <laughs> yes. they've got used to the teacher they know what they're happening and the parent doesn't like the change so it's you know we need to include everybody really it's the teacher the child and the parent that go through that transition together really and I think you know you've hit the nail on the head there because I think we you know anybody listening who has a role in school will know of a parent that's been more worried about something whatever that is um than their child and I think you know that's why for me it is absolutely crucial that we do involve everybody and like you say the teaching staff too or the school staff too because everyone's going through that change in some way um it will have an impact on them won't it absolutely absolutely I mean it from a teacher's perspective um in our school certainly in other schools I've worked in as well it's that comprehensive a comprehensive handover that you need with that new teacher so we need to give teachers time to spend together um so they can share not just data it's not just about numbers and those dry things it's about the personality of the child isn't it about um those details that can often start a positive teacher pupil relationship if they feel that they've already sort of been known a little so it's it's passing on those but they like to do this they don't like to do that it's not just about those those data those dry scores but you know they're sort of human beings with personalities and interests aren't they oh definitely so and actually that that point you made there about data was you know I I had a role previously as head of science and I quite quickly realized it wasn't quite for me I mean I love teaching science don't get me wrong but the data side of it and you know wanting you know the the kind of drive to get a certain amount of pupils to get this amount this, this grade and I just thought they're human beings they have likes and interests and lives and things that happen so I really love that you've you know put that at the heart of what you're doing um yeah, not absolutely. just their data and I think, you know, a top tip of mine that I've learned over the years is that we often start these meetings with um, an alphabet uh, alphabetical list of the class and we never quite get to the bottom of the class because we, <laughs> we never have enough time to do it. So my, my sort of tip is group your your send children and your children you need to talk about put those at the top of your list don't have that alphabetical list that class list that we always do mm. let's start at the top and we don't get past g because the bell's <laughs> gone and we've got to go and do something else so it's those pupils that we especially have to talk about that's not saying the other pupils aren't important it's just that we really do need to share that that information that will help those pupils that are more likely to find those transitions more difficult yeah and that that's really, I, I like that reflection because I've, I've seen exactly that done. You know, class list, let's, let's start at A and work our way down. And like you say, you get so far through and then that's it. And actually your child with SEN was probably the one with an S letter surname and they did, exactly. you didn't quite get to them. <laughs> um, and then yeah, people are going, exactly. oh my goodness, what do I do with this one when they come into my classroom next year? Um, totally. So yeah, I, that's really interesting that you've got that focus on preparing the staff um absolutely you know, and also 
also I use my send register it's quite a beast of a document my uh, the teachers that I work with probably tell you that um, <laughs> as will my SLT team but it makes me feel secure in the knowledge that the teachers can go on to the SEN register I share the link every term um, when new staff join it's got absolutely everything on there it's got diagnosis it's got current classroom strategies adaptations along with the child's current needs plus also their their scores and data so it's all there and then what I do is I encourage the the teachers to then update it on a regular basis so there's always that um, that sort of current what is happening with that child what do they need in class what um, what um, groups are they uh, sorry intervention groups that they're, they're yep. sort of joining into and then I'm going to make a copy of that and then I will start afresh in the new year but they can always go back and have a look to see what's already been tried so it's it's that sort of gathering information about that child and making sure that we have that trail of information um, literally that we can trail it through school um, because it's it's just really important that as the children grow and change and some things we've tried kind of will work and something we'll have to try again perhaps in a, a year's time two years time when they're developmentally ready so it's good for teachers to see to get to know that child what's been tried before what can I try now that sounds like such a lovely system because we know don't we with students that have SEN that you do have to keep adapting the strategies. Sometimes what you've decided to try doesn't work, but that doesn't mean it's never going to work. As you say, it might just be when, when they're ready, it will have a better impact. So when we're talking about preparing students for transition, I think the fact you've got that holistic picture of them as they've mm. tracked through, mm. that must be so useful for the staff to see what's come before and therefore kind of where that student is heading. Absolutely. And I think I know it's sort of it is quite a beast of a thing to manage, but it it works. It just I mean, it really works. Yeah. But um, something else as well that I was thinking about is sort of is having the teachers talk about transition for them because the teachers are transitioning to a new class. And we yes. talk a lot about modelling our feelings and modelling um, how we're, we're sort of dealing with those. And our teachers in our school, certainly, they, they move classes every year. Um, they often discuss with the children how it feels and, uh, you know, to not know what's happening because until there's a certain point, our teachers won't know what class they're teaching and what mm. classroom they'll be in. So they'll say, you know, if the teacher, if the children start saying, oh, I'm just a bit worried. So can the teacher say, well, so am I actually, because I don't know which class I'm going to. It's an unknown, isn't it? And it's making me feel a bit worried inside. So using that sort of declarative language as well to talk to children shows them they're not alone in those worries. And it's not just something that children go through, that adults go through that too. I think that is such an important point because... Like you say, the modelling, um, you know, for all students, I think now, and this is not just for those with SCN, but the modelling that it's OK to have feelings and it's OK to talk about them and teaching them the vocabulary around that. But what a way to, I, I don't I don't think I've ever heard anybody acknowledge that moving classroom for a teacher could be just as challenging, you know, for them. They've got to take all their stuff. They know, you know, you spend a year in a room, you know exactly where the glue sticks are, don't you? If you've exactly. got Exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, where the creaky with, floorboards are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know where all those things are without thinking about it. And, we, you know, we talked about routine and structure giving us psychological safety and reducing cognitive load. And actually what we're yep. doing is putting teachers almost in the same situation as the students. Exactly. Um, and I, I know one one teacher at school is so good at doing this. And it's about that sort of we're modelling how to feel and respond to natural endings because the, the yeah. children are coming to a natural ending. And so are the teachers as well. And it's it's, you know, sort of reassuring the children that we're all we're still going to be here. The classroom is still going to be here. You can visit your old classroom if you want. Have a little look. Talk about your <laughs> your memories. And it's it's also about saying to children, isn't it, that. I'm still here if obviously you haven't left to, to, <laughs> yeah. to go to a new role yeah. but uh, you know I'm still here pop in come and see me you can have a chat if you want to it's and it's it's showing that we value those connections that we've made and that they don't yeah. have to end just because you're in a different classroom I mean clearly children think they're most children think their teachers are the best thing since sliced sli bread and, <laughs> and can't bear leaving them until they go to their next teacher and the last one's dead to them but, yeah. <laughs> but you know there are yeah. still many pupils that seek out their favorite teacher and it's 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 really lovely to sort of promote that prolonged connection yes you've moved on but I'm still here yes and yeah again I think what a lovely thing that you have that 
openness around that because so many times I think part of the anxiety that people feel around change is that they have this you know it's, it's perceived but it's like it's finite you know I've finished being in year three or I've finished being with Mr or Mrs Jones and I'm never going to see them again and it's all going to be horrible and oh dear when actually yeah. like you say that's you know they might not be their class teacher they're not seeing them for six seven hours a day but they are just down the corridor and you can pop in and say hello absolutely and it's lovely to have that conversation isn't it because children are still learning and growing and developing and not everything is obvious and especially with our SEN pupils you know that hidden curriculum isn't always obvious so it's quite nice for a teacher to say it is okay to come and see me I would like you to come and see me if you want to yeah uh, that you know as a strategy I think that is brilliant and you know we're talking earlier on about things that don't cost money you know don't don't take a lot of time don't don't need a lot of resources but they're things that make a big difference and that must be really powerful I imagine for some of your students to know that that person is still there absolutely absolutely and something else I was thinking about today actually I was talking with my I have my lovely year nines who I describe mm. as my puppies because they are just so enthusiastic <laughs> they're lovely and I said to them you know do we do enough for you do we what do you think about transition you're going into year 10 how do you feel yeah. about it and they were they were quite happy to to know that they've chosen their options and that they're quite excited to be sort of the higher end of the the year of the school mm -hmm. now they're talking about there are fewer classes above them so they felt there were more classes below them so of course <laughs> it's that natural hierarchy isn't it yeah but they, but they did say that they they came up with a couple of really good ideas themselves they said that they would have loved to have gone to some GCSE les lessons to try them out just to see what it was like I yeah. thought that was interesting. And they also said they would like to talk to the current year 10s about what it's like to study GCSEs and what would they do now knowing that they've done it after a year. And I thought, well, that was really interesting. And my overarching point here is we need to talk to the pupils and ask them what they want. And we mustn't always sort of presume that we need we know. Mm. Uh, that's that's. Yeah, I love that point because pupil voice, you know, it's. I think, again, it's one of those things we're talking today about transition within the same school, which I don't think gets enough focus. I think, you know, pupil voice can be really powerful, but in a lot of places can be done. It's not purely as a tick box exercise to say, yes, we've done it, but I'm not sure how much um, weight it's given, you know, the outcomes of those conversations or questionnaires or whatever it is a school has done. Yeah, um, yeah. But it sounds like what your students have told you, those year nines, are, again, things that are hopefully quite easy to put into practice. Yeah, exactly. And that, that I've said to them, you've given me some great ideas to go and talk to our senior leadership team about. And they were, they were sort of, oh, really, are you going to do that? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm more than happy to go and do that. Yeah. And I, I guess in a, in a similar way, then, is the, is the follow on from that to perhaps speak to either that same group you know about what might have helped them when they were lower down the school doing transition or to speak to the students that are currently you know in a, a lower age group and um, see what their thoughts are yeah I mean this this idea has just come out of today but you're right to extend it would be even better wouldn't it to use these pupils the current year nines to then talk to the year eights and the year eights talking to the sevens I mean we've even talked about as well I, I know this program's not about um, transition for year six and year seven but we have recently discussed having our year sixes come up and spending break times with our year sevens so it is about using that sort of cascade of, of sort of you know that natural hierarchy that exists that they can talk and say well no how's it in year seven how's it in year eight what what happens at GCSE you know do you suddenly worry about GCSEs or how do you get through the workload it's quite nice for them to be talking to each other so um, yeah there was lots to think about actually just coming out of today's conversation yeah what what I like there is you know whether it's the break time thing which you know I suppose you know thinking about what the year nine said about being able to talk to current year tens what you're doing then is kind of creating an organic situation or an organic conversation rather than saying you must go and sit with this person and they're going to tell you about xyz you're actually allowing that conversation to flow naturally which you know whatever those students want to talk about 
Absolutely. I mean, we all know that when we're sort of sitting in a, a you know, a and a and we're faced with ask a question, then a we've completely forgotten the question or don't want to ask the question because you don't want to put a hand up. But you're totally right. Those parallel play opportunities, those side by side where they're not sort of eyeballing each other. Lots of chat and conversation will come out naturally. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. As, and again, I think your point earlier on was, you know, we don't always know. You know, let, let's let's find yeah. out from the students. And I suppose that's that's quite a nice sort of lead in as well then to what about the parents? What do they want? Yeah, I mean, the parents we've been having, I've been having a mammoth task of meeting all my parents, my LS parents, certainly, and planning for September and sort of, you know, evaluating their IEPs, planning for the next step. Um, putting in the current assessment, celebrating success, doing all those things. It's not always negative in, in LS. There's lots to celebrate too. Yeah. And um, so we've been sort of saying, this is what we're going to do. These are the needs. I've been having meetings with um, some parents who are going from one transition point to another where we've had to put in slightly more support for our child and discussing with the parents how we're going to do that, how we're going to support their child. Um, maybe we need to apply for an, an EHC needs assessment, those sorts of things. Or yep. maybe it's just that we need to put in more strategies or some resources for them to use. Or we've got an intervention. So it's having those conversations and having them before September. So they don't arrive and we go, right, we need to have a conversation. I'm Emma from LS. And of course, that's yes. a bit worrying for parents, isn't it? So it's nice to have those conversations beforehand. So I've got things set out. Parents know what's going to happen. They'll get their IEPs that will happen. will will start in September. Yeah. And also, so of the teachers, the teachers have got it too. Um, but I have worked in a school where we've had things such as open house. That works quite nice where you invite parents in in the first or second week and you invite them in and they can come and see the classroom, see where their child is going to be sitting, um, looking at their tray, perhaps, or, you know, just being introducing to the teacher as well. And like you say, it's that that sort of putting a, a name to a face. Um, all teachers have reputations in schools. I've got yes. four children myself, so I know the reputations we have and my <laughs> colleagues have. Yep. And, you know, it's it's nice to put a, a name to a face, isn't it? And humanise that person that you may have heard something about necessarily, but you, you don't actually know them. So it, that's really good. And to see where your child is sitting and then that can alleviate some of those parental anxieties that often happen as well. Mm. And I think that that's really nice to because some of those little like we said the little things do make a big difference and I suppose it's important to bear in mind that you know some of the anxieties that the parents have might be coming from their own experience not just the experience of their child absolutely yep because I think you know when like you say talking about where are they going to sit do they know where they line up for lunch you know all of those things mm. probably could actually apply to most of us when we've gone even work isn't it? actually when we move from one job to another and think oh, where's the photocopier um, absolutely yeah. where's the How toilet do... am I allowed yeah. to use Where... that toilet am I allowed to use this cup in the staff room yeah, <laughs> yeah. Am I... does it need a lid if I go down the corridor <laughs> yeah exactly what's the rules in this place and the rules can change I mean yes we have the overarching rules of our school but each each teacher is free to to sort of run their class you know pretty much as they as they want it which is which is how we want it isn't it we want to give them yeah. the professional freedom and some will be sterner than others some will be friendlier than others you know and it's just the way that that human natures work and actually children respond to different teachers in different ways don't they and so it's nice for the parents to come in and sort of look at oh this is the seat they're going to be sitting that's the toilet they're going to be using yeah. and and it's yeah. sharing of those routines when do I need to bring the PE kit in when does it need to go home when is swimming swimming is always an issue <laughs> <laughs> of people yeah. forgetting their swimming kits and all that sort of stuff so it's it's nice to have that shared with you and yeah. you know sort of you're meeting other parents as well and and it's those lovely times when parents can come into school and see each other as well, because quite often these days we're all so busy and those sort of parental opportunities to perhaps chat at the gate, find out that information about a certain thing that's happening doesn't always happen, does it? No, you're quite right. And I think that's, you know, in some ways we live in such a connected world, don't we, with, you know, social media and you know, quite often as teachers we get the dreaded parent WhatsApp group, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. 
at the end of the day, we, we do have that level of connectivity, but we do somehow seem to have lost some of the connection, the, the hu- like you said, the human side of it, the face-to-face. And, you know, I've absolutely seen the same thing. When you get parents in a room together, it's almost like sometimes the best thing you can do is just give them time. Yes. You know, yes, let them have those conversations. The the end. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And just making yourself available as well. I mean, we all know some parents can be can want to want too much attention and want much reassurance but it's just making sure that the balance is right that they we reassure where they really do need it as well yeah. isn't it yeah and and their expectations which I mentioned earlier in the show that you know like you've said the expectation for some of the parents when they come in September is that xyz strategies will be in place because you've already had that preemptive conversation and it, yeah. it made me think, actually, of something I was reading earlier today, completely unrelated to this idea of transition, but it does have a, a link, I think, give, especially given what you've said, that this person was commenting that um, they've got a student who's, you know, got, it sounds like some varying needs going on, and they've tried various forms of support. They've got to a point where this student was, you know, in a good place let's let's put it that way they were in a good place they were back accessing lessons they were not struggling as much with their behavior and everything else and then the conversation that they had to go and have with whoever it was in their school was you know no I'm not going to take this child's support away because this person this other person was saying well they're all right now but actually they're all right because that support is support (laughs) exactly yeah exactly so I think and it's Go on. Sorry, go on. It's so important that 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 the support is identified and continued by the next teacher, which is what we were yeah. talking about earlier on, isn't it? It's that comprehensive yeah. handover. It's making sure all the information is still there, despite the fact you've been in, where you've had the class for two months, and you think, oh, I just want to check. Did they have this? Have they done this before? Mm. It's quite nice to be able to go back and read up about the child and do it in an easy way, so you don't have to plow through a filing cabinet because we all know that. The, <laughs> The yeah. time there's no time for such things these days is there <laughs> no um but yes it, it is about that isn't it? it's about sort of continuing that support and understanding it's the support that's underpinning that child's stability and feeling of safety as well yeah definitely um i'm just going to pick up on one one more thing while we're talking about strategies and sort of the what you know what we can do um mm-hmm. before we sort of have a, a little bit of a change of shift if you like but um we talk about transition and supporting the change before it happens. I wonder about, you know, almost like post-transition support. And you've kind of touched on it because you were saying, you know, your child that's in year five can go down the corridor and talk to their year four teacher. But is there something there around, and you, you mentioned actually, you know, six, eight weeks down the line, you've got to know your class, you're starting to, you know, really know them as individuals and everything else. But if you've got someone who's struggling, who's the person that's best placed to kind of go, have you tried this? Have you thought of that? It's probably your year four teacher, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, we've all had experience of of children that perhaps haven't settled for whatever reason. Um, and it's not necessarily anything that the new teacher is doing. It's just that the child mm. finds that much more difficult than their peers do. And it would be good to talk to the previous teacher. I mean, we all sit around in the staff room at various different times and people do discuss pupils. You know, how do I do this? What would you advise me? You know this people really well. The The interesting thing about our school is that we have... A sort of a, a pseudo secondary model in years, uh, key stage two. So lots mm-hmm. of our pupils are taught by specialist teachers anyway. So they go to a different room and a different teacher. So they are kind of used to sort of forming those relationships with more than one adult in school or more than just the TA and the teacher. So there are more adults for them to go to. Also our, our LS children as well, they they stay with me and also my Senko assistant as well. So we keep them. So that's that constant relationship. So if they are a little bit worried, the teacher can always come and talk to us. They can talk to the previous teacher and the, the child can do that too. They are absolutely free to come and talk to us. Sometimes they don't want to, but we let them know. Again, it's that understanding that they might not see that this is an obvious thing. So we say to them, look, I can see that you're feeling a little sad at the moment, that if you would like to talk to me, I am always here, but it's OK if you don't want to. It's also OK that you might want to go and talk to somebody else. Yeah. 
it's it's just such a and I know we you know we said your your school you do have some advantages because of the way you're set up but I think there's lots there that people can take away and adapt for their own setting and I just want to kind of sum up this section um before we take a break for the news I think you know if I was to kind of encapsulate what we've talked about it's transition actually whether it's year six to seven or whatever year group it is it's about that wraparound so I'm talking about wraparound all of the people involved so the staff and the parents as well as the child but it's also a wraparound in terms of the time so you've you're already doing transition work now and actually that will that won't stop in September you know those conversations are ongoing so it kind of transition overlaps the, the end of one year and, and into a next yeah that's a really good point and and I think it does and I think it does that echoes life as well we don't just neatly end one thing because we're an adult that's and we very know true. That we've left the job where and then begin the next thing perhaps the next day the next week or the next month you know and especially for teachers you leave at one school in July and perhaps don't go to another school until September so you've got that all that worry yourself so yeah. you're absolutely right transition itself isn't a neat thing it doesn't just happen overnight and we've clicked a finger and everything's OK. Some of us need a little bit more. I know personally I do. I find transitions myself much more difficult. It takes me a long time to sort of build up to the change, work through the change, get over yeah. the change. So, you know, as an adult, I absolutely understand that our children will will also find this difficult, too, whereas some will be absolutely fine. Like it's <laughs> like it's, you know, woohoo, lead me to year five. Where's the door kind of thing? <laughs> yeah. So yes, it's definitely. different, isn't it? And it's about that definitely. relationship, isn't it? And knowing each child as an individual. Yes. Emma, that's been absolutely fantastic. And there's there's so much there. I mean, we could carry on talking for I don't know how long about these <laughs> strategies. Um, my favourite what... subjects. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much. What we're going to do is have a quick break now while we hear the news and hear from our sponsors. And then I'll come back to you to think about the impact that some of these transition strategies will have. Brilliant. Reading Solutions UK. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Join the free online international reading conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of June. Hear from speakers like TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui. Beloved children's author Michael Rosen, fluency expert Tim Rosinski, EEF specialist Chloe Butlin, the National Literacy Trust's Irene Picton, and a range of experienced practitioners, including MAT leaders, deputy heads, heads of English, high level teaching assistants, and school librarians. Through the three-day conference, speakers will explore a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape, with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Visit Reading Solutions at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk for more information and to sign up for this free conference. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio <coughs> News. The BBC reports on proposed changes to sex and relationship education guidance for schools in England. According to the report on the news website, government sources have told the BBC about the plans, which include banning sex education for under nines, as well as additional guidance for teaching about gender identity. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak said the new guidance would ensure children were not exposed to disturbing content. Teachers have responded with concerns that some of the guidance appears contradictory and say there is no evidence of a widespread problem with current guidance. The new plan says secondary school pupils will learn about protected characteristics such as sexual orientation and gender reassignment but makes it clear that schools should not teach about the concept of gender identity. It said it was right to take a cautious approach. Education Secretary Gillian Keegan, speaking on BBC Breakfast, said biological sex is the basis of relationship sex and health education, not these contested views. 
Askell's General Secretary said that it was important that banning the teaching of gender identity did not shut down discussion and that young people must be able to discuss this without their teachers feeling in peril of saying something wrong. The new guidance also strengthens rules to make it easier for parents to access teaching materials to see what their children are learning, although many point out that this guidance is currently in place. Lucy Emerson of the Sex Education Forum said, if topics were to be restricted, it will leave children even more dependent on getting answers from online sources. The draft guidance is now open to a nine-week consultation, but once finalised, will be statutory. An outline of the proposed new age restrictions can be found on the BBC News website and the consultation on the Department for Education website. In the United States, pro-Palestinian protests at colleges and universities have made the news again, as some graduates from Duke University in North Carolina staged a walkout. The protest came just prior to a speech by veteran comedian Jerry Seinfeld, who was due to receive an honorary degree. Mr Seinfeld has been a vocal supporter of Israel since the 7th of October attacks by Hamas. Some students stayed to hear the speech, but videos posted on social media also showed some booing and chanting slogans in support of Palestine. Whilst the ceremony at Duke went ahead, plans at other universities, including Columbia and the University of Southern California, have cancelled or restructured their main graduation ceremonies to avoid further complications. The Daily Mirror features comments from strictly judge Shirley Ballas about free school meals. She focuses on her own experiences of being raised by a single mother and says she understands what increasing numbers of British children living in poverty are going through. She recalls looking forward to her free school meal, referring to it as a nice lunch every day. At 63, Ms Ballas is hoping to use her experiences to highlight the issue of poverty by being part of an ITV documentary called Kids in Poverty. According to the Mirror, 4.3 million children in Britain get their only meal a day at school. 30% of UK children are living below the poverty line, with a million classed as being in extreme poverty. Figures from the Joseph Rowntree Foundation say that the share of children living in absolute poverty has increased by 148% since 2017 and is at its highest level for 30 years. The documentary can be seen on demand and full details of the article from the Mirror are on its website. Finally, students at Lancaster University have voted for all food served on campus to be plant-based, according to BBC Radio Lancashire. The Students' Union is supporting the gradual transition to 100% vegan menus, with a target of 50% by 2025, and 100% by 2027. A campaigner told the BBC that Lancaster University has a goal of net zero by 2035 and that implementing a plant-based catering system aligns with this goal. The Countryside Alliance said too few students had been involved in the decision, with 18 of the 19 delegates on the Students' Union Council, who do represent 13,000 students, voting to support the motion but the Countryside Alliance called it an attack on freedom of choice and said the decision should have been put to a wider student vote. Universities including Stirling, Warwick and Newcastle have also voted to go plant-based, although Edinburgh rejected the plan. The votes have been organised following Animal Rising's plant-based universities campaign. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Jo Fox. Okay, welcome back to the Twilight Show. Um, today we're thinking about how we support transition um, within a school. So year three to four, for example, seven to eight, nine to ten, and so on. I um, had a lovely chat with Emma before the break about what we can do to support the transition process. Um, but I think it's really important that we think about the why, particularly for an area of school life that doesn't get as much support or perhaps focus as, as other things do. Now, from my point of view, um, and a little bit of background, background research, you know, a quick recap here on the fact that supporting transition can help alleviate some of the anxieties. Um, and interestingly, Emma picked up on the fact this is not just 
um, anxieties that the students might have, but their their family and also the school staff themselves. So it's important that we manage those expectations um, and that we we give people the chance to process the things that are going to be different, um, but also thinking about some of the things that are going to be the same. And I really liked what Emma said earlier on about the teachers, you know, they are down the corridor and it's okay for people to go and say hello, for the students to pop back and, and see their their previous teacher if they want to. Um, and if we think, you know, that that was, you know, I think a particular year group we were talking about. I was I was reading some bits about GCSE students recently and how staff are really concerned about their level, not not engagement as such, but their attitude towards learning. And somebody did actually use the word apathetic. They said they're just not bothered. They're not revising. They don't seem to be particularly concerned about the impact that would have. They don't seem particularly concerned about, you know, if what grade they're going to get. Um, and I just think, you know, if we could perhaps prepare them a bit more for what they are going to experience, you know, maybe we would, I'm not saying it's going to take away those issues or resolve them, but maybe it would go some way to addressing the issues that we are seeing. And then that made me think about, you know, some of the younger students, you know, right at the beginning of their school career. I mentioned some some points uh, that Leanne shared earlier in the show about, you know, reception not being effectively prepared for year one. They've been in school in an environment where it's very much around playing, very much around, you know, interacting, moving, doing all those things that you would expect young young children to do. And then they move into year one and they need to sit at a desk. They need to perhaps, you know, do some mark making, learning, learning to write ultimately. Um, and the last thing we want to be doing is losing students at such a young age that we can't bring them back or that it's very hard to bring them back or they end up with gaps developing earlier on. And, it, you know, it's like a wedge. It just gets wider and wider. So, you know, if you are listening in and you've, you've got some strategies or you've got any thoughts on, on what we've talked about so far or what we're about to move on to do, I'd love to hear from you. So please do um, pop a message in, in the text box. Um, Emma, it'd be great to come back to you now and just have a think, you know, about the why. You know, why are we going to support transition perhaps more than we do? The impact that would have, and obviously, you know, behaviour and attitudes are things we talk about a lot. So I wonder if we could start with those. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really interesting, isn't it? Because obviously we're talking about children in school and we're wanting them to learn and we're wanting them to behave and want their attitude to learning to be amazing. But mm. I think really, in essence, we just want them to be happy human beings first because we know that children who feel safe and secure are more likely to learn and they'll do it naturally and they'll find the process of learning easier. And that, that in turn means that they'll need less support, they'll need less resources, they'll need you know, there'll be far less stress. So this idea of, of preparing those in-school transitions are really, really important because we know what it's like when we, we go into a new situation and we're very, very nervous. And, you know, it sets us off and we're not quite listening because we're so worried about an aspect. You know, am I wearing the right shoes? Are they, you know, if I parked in the right place? It's, it's yeah. that kind of thing when we start a new job. It's exactly the same for children, isn't it? So if we can get them on that first day coming in, um, you know, separating from their caregivers in a happy and safe and secure way, walking in the door, maybe not with a smile on their face because it is the first day, but knowing where their peg is and hanging it up, finding that seat that they know where it is and, you know, finding that friend that they know is in their class, it's really going to help them. It's, it's so important. Yeah. And I just want to pick up actually on something you said there because, you know, about parking your car in the right place. Are you wearing the right shoes? If you start, you know, any of us, when we start a new job, the rest of the staff team, or, you know, particularly if we're going to be linked with a certain department or, you know, whoever it is, they are going to be very mindful of the fact that, you know, we're nervous. They might be nervous as well, actually, about meeting a new person and, and making yeah. them feel at home. You know, if it's somebody going into a new job, we don't consider that unusual. We actually say, yeah, that's perfectly normal. What can I do to help? So it's yeah, interesting, absolutely. actually, that we don't do as much 
for our students and when we know right. how much we value that support. You're absolutely right. I mean, you think about when we join a new school, we gen auction, don't we? We might get mm. invited in. I certainly do with my school. We have to come in uh, um, uh, specifically for an induction day, actually, to meet all the other new yeah. staff and to be handed your lanyard and, you know, what's code for the printer and all of this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, you're exactly right. And then there's that pathway, isn't there, of please read this document, tick this box, meet with this person, go and meet yeah. your head teacher. And all of this sort of lovely induction pathway that we have um, and, and, you know, we sort of maybe give our children, I don't know, maybe the first half of the first day and right, you're done now. Come on, let's get on with our history in the afternoon or let's go swimming or whatever. But you're right. It, it's that sort of that continued making sure that actually as, a, as an adult, we would need that continued support. And it's not unreasonable that children would need that too. some children, mm. not all children, of course, some children, as we've said, will just run in bouncing like it's the best thing ever. So it's just identifying and building those relationships, isn't it? Yeah. And, and really, that is just a, uh, that's a picture of life, isn't it? Because there will be adults who bounce into a room full of people they don't know, new <laughs> job, whatever, and, and they're absolutely, absolutely fine with that in the same way as they're people who will have the complete opposite reaction. You know, children and adults, essentially, we are all human beings and we have human we responses are. to things, aren't we? Absolutely, definitely. And it's it's that learning that relationships move on and natural endings as I said earlier on it's all part of life and it's a it's a positive it can be positive or of course it can be negative those endings sometimes we don't want yeah. those endings to end but it's teaching those children isn't it I mean I remember one teacher last year um, a new teacher we had at, at school that's still with us and continuing with us and you know they were saying to the children I'm so sorry I have no idea what time it is at assembly <laughs> <laughs> we'll all learn together yeah. and there were there were quite a few moments where, comedy moments where this poor teacher arrived sort of f five minutes later for something or then sort of said in the staff room I'm so sorry I didn't know I was supposed to do that so <laughs> it was lovely to see them like I was saying earlier on modeling that behavior to the children going well I'm you too and I have no idea <laughs> so it's it's that it's that you know it's it's the children get to see an adult in real life going, I'm sorry, I, I don't have the answer for that right now, but um, I'll just go and ask someone who's worked here for longer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, that's lovely that you have created a culture where that is OK, because I think, you know, we can have a whole separate show on. There has been several shows on sort of staff retention and recruitment. And, you know, as, as an adult, if you didn't feel supported, you wouldn't stay there. You have the choice to pack up your bags and leave and go find another job but students they don't have that that choice you know they're in your school they are there for the next however many years so they're mm. kind of their only option if they want to pack up their bags and leave is almost to kind of mentally check out or their behavior takes a turn for the worse absolutely so, absolutely you know th thinking here that the impact you know we're thinking about the why why is it important we support transition is again it's that holistic need isn't it it's not just their academic now it's it's bigger absolutely yes it's it's what you said and what I said at the beginning it's about that um it's it's that sort of human being a human being first and if you're a happy human I know it sounds a bit sort of you know new age and everything but actually it, it's true isn't it if you're it's happy true, yeah. you are more than likely it's that cognitive overload is reduced you're you're firing your brain's firing it's ready to take that information it's doing it in a positive way you're looking forward to coming to school the next day because you're going to see your best friend or your friend you've just made or your teacher's promise that something amazing is going to happen <laughs> it's it's that sort of excitement and that buzz that you want with learning don't you absolutely and I suppose you know underpinning that a bit like you said before is also the parents because we know that you know particularly for students and you know sweeping statement won't be true for everybody but you know attendance is is an issue um you know whether that student's taking more days off you know more sort of ad hoc days off or whether they're having blocks of time away from school and you know it's only one part of the issue but it can quite often have something to do with parent perceptions around school so yeah again you know absolutely. if we're thinking about impact yeah if you've got parents who understand what's going on is that then mm. helping the students you know, again, that holistic picture. 
Definitely, because you won't get that negativity at home where parents are, well, I don't know when swimming is. I don't know when you're supposed to bring your kit in. And it's it's that sort of communication that we can smooth it out, can't we? If we can keep the parents informed, then they're more likely to be happier with what's going on. They are more happier that their children go in and everything's OK. It's, it's that sort of circle, isn't it, really? If everyone's yeah. calm, the teachers, the children and the parents, then, you know, we've got the good conditions for learning, haven't we, really? Yeah, and you know that that's absolutely you know what what we want, isn't it? Because children, you think about you know, that tools like Maslow's hierarchy and all sorts of other research. You know, they for anybody to learn, they first got to feel safe. Definitely. And if they're coming in, they're already anxious. They're already worrying about X, Y, Z. They're they're not feeling completely safe. So over time, those those little bits will add up to you know, especially in your school where they're with you, you know, it's all through, isn't it, from when they start school right through to GCSEs and whatever. Yeah, absolutely, they can be. If they've got lots of little things that, yeah, if they've got lots of little things that have gone wrong, that's going to have quite a cumulative effect over time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And it's, it's about keeping those communication lines open, is it? If, if parents have a difficulty, whenever I have a meeting with a parent, the last thing I will say to them is I'm always here. You don't have to worry about your name. If any issues at all, just email. We can have a chat. We, you know, we can just chat outside, or you can come in for a formal meeting if you'd like. It's just keeping it and reminding them. It's again, it goes back to that saying the obvious. Uh, we are still here. Don't have to wait for your meeting or for the next time that you're in. Yeah, and I think that's really nice because I think, particularly as students get older. There is a bit of a perception that schools become more remote from the family. Um, And actually, you know, we know for all students, but particularly those with special educational needs, it's kind of in the definition. They have additional needs. They need more support as they're going along, don't they? And, And probably the same is true of their family. Yeah, definitely. And it's, yeah, yeah, I mean, Um, sorry, go on. No, got you. Oh, you. sorry. How are you? No, I'm I, enjoying listening. Uh, <laughs> just what I'm saying, it, it, it is definitely it's supporting the parents. I mean, my my parents were with younger children. We are sort of sometimes we're gathering that evidence. We're having conversations. Some of the conversations parents find a bit more difficult. Sometimes the, the parents are bringing those conversations to me. Um, it is in that relationship and making sure that we we're taking the parent on the journey as mild. You're exactly right. I love that phrase. I'm actually um, going to write that down because I don't know if you know, but so after the show, we, we put this out as a podcast. So people who, you know, if you're not listening live um, and you have downloaded it, thank you very much. But I love that that little phrase you just said there um, that, you know, we're all on a journey together. Um, and that transition yeah. process is around everyone moving in the same direction. Yeah, we all want what's best for for the pupil, the child, the young person, whoever they are. We want what's best for them. So it's, it's great that it, we can all work together. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm Emma. I am mindful of your time. I mean, you've been absolutely brilliant sharing all sorts of thoughts and ideas this evening. And as I said, we could carry on talking um, forever and a day. <laughs> I think, but just just wondering, you know, where there are you know, schools that aren't doing as much at the moment around transition. Um, what, but, you know, obviously your school are doing a lot and you, you've clearly spearheaded a lot of, of those things. Um, what would you say to those schools in terms of, you know, if you did do a bit more, the impact would be, you know, X, Y, Z. What would you say to them? Um, I would definitely say that that handover that's the easiest thing it's the free thing it won't cost anything it's that sharing of information giving teachers time to talk to each other and I know that the time education is is everyone's you know it's difficult for everybody to find enough time to do everything but if if CLE's head teachers could think that actually giving those the teachers time to talk to each other to share that information that would be amazing that would be the first thing I think and I know many schools do that but I, I don't believe they get enough time to do that yeah and I, I liked your point there um earlier on about um I'm saying this just in case anybody missed it that 
you know, don't necessarily go through the class list in alphabetical order. If you're going to do that meeting, which I think sounds brilliant, you know, think about who your priority students are. Absolutely. We all, I mean, I've done it myself. We come to the end of the meeting and we go, oh, we've missed out X, Y, Z. And we're like, oh, well, we'll have to pick up for the mm. next meeting and then the next meeting for maybe in two weeks time or something. And we might have missed something. So we don't want to do that. So it is just being prepared for that meeting and just saying, these are the children I definitely need to talk to you about. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, like you say, that's not forgetting the other students. That's just making sure that there is time and space for the ones who need that that little bit extra which I, I think is, is really really good yeah definitely I mean all um, pupils are important we know that <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah they definitely are definitely are um I mean you I know you said there isn't a cost obviously there's no financial cost in the sense of asking staff to to meet but you know there is a there is a, an element there of a time factor yeah um so you know and we know that getting staff together can sometimes be a little bit tricky, particularly if you're trying to do it in the day and you're trying to look at cover and who's going to have that class for a little while and whatever. But, you know, so, yes, there is a cost to doing some of these things. But what what are your thoughts on the benefits versus the cost of doing it? Well, it goes back to that happy and safe and secure child, doesn't it? It's a happy human being. But also, they are happy in the class and they are ready to learn. And it, you know, as educators, that's what we want all our pupils to be. We want them to be happy, but also ready to learn. And, you know, that can only impact those scores and assessments, which, again, everybody is, I know teachers kind of go, yes, but I want the, the happy person first. But we are we are judged on our scores as well. So it, it sort of feeds into that. It feeds into everything, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. And, you know, I think the one thing, you know people listening taking away for me as well taking away from this show is not to get bogged down in sort of one particular area so you know it's not just about the data it's not just about one specific aspect of their school life you know the the transition package needs to support all different areas and ultimately you know you're then talking about outcomes happy human beings you kind of tick all of the boxes that we have issues with. You know, there's lots of schools talking about behaviour difficulties, more and more students presenting um, with issues around engagement, presenting with issues around their mental health, families um, struggling to engage or perhaps sometimes not engaging appropriately with schools. That's that's becoming a thing as well, isn't it? And actually, yeah, sadly. all of that, whilst... No, I know. And, and whilst there's... There's not one magic wand. I mean, if there was, if only, <laughs> yeah. we'd all have waved it by now anyway. Absolutely. But, you know, it does feel like, yeah, it, it does feel like if we did put a little bit more emphasis on these these changes that actually, you know, a lot of the issues we're seeing would, would definitely be reduced, if not removed. Yeah, I think they would definitely. And it, it just makes that first day and those first few days and those first couple of weeks go smoothly for everybody I think yes yeah you know Emma that's that's absolutely brilliant and I think you know anybody whether you are listening live thank you very much um and people who've downloaded the podcast thank you to you as well you know your your strategies from earlier in the show and you know now we're talking about the reasons why this stuff is important I mean I I don't think anybody can argue with it <laughs> to be honest I think it's just you know, it's something we should all all be doing, um, which is why I wanted to to have this show actually to highlight something that you know I think does get missed and would have a massive impact for relatively little, um, you know, cost in terms of time and resources and yeah, so on. Definitely, um, definitely. But as I say, Emma, it's you know not only is it Friday night, but it is also the start of half term. So um, I just wanted to ask you before I let you go to enjoy your week off. Any final thoughts you would like to leave our listeners with? Oh, final thoughts. Um, have a lovely half term. You deserve it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, just to have have a lovely time, half term. Make sure you've had time. I say this to my pupils, actually. Every pupil who left my classes over the past couple of days, if I saw them the last time, I, I say to them, find time for fun in the holidays. Find time for rest in the holidays, too. Especially my GCSE pupils, who are very stressed at the moment. Some of, some of them aren't so stressed for different reasons, but, but uh, it is that just make sure you rest. Rest is important. Change is as good as a rest. Oh, absolutely. Um. 
that's that's brilliant. I love how you've summed up, uh, particularly when we've been talking about transition to finish with that changes as good as yeah. the rest. Um, very well played there. Well played. <laughs> um, Emma, thank you so much because it has been brilliant talking to you. Um, as I say, we'll let you get on to enjoy your holiday. Going to hear once again from our sponsors and then finish off the last part of the show with my usual little section, the wellbeing word for the weekend. Reading Solutions UK. Are you looking for best practices and innovative strategies to foster confident, lifelong readers? Join the free online international reading conference on the 11th, 12th and 13th of June. Hear from speakers like TV personality and education expert Basit Siddiqui. Beloved children's author Michael Rosen, fluency expert Tim Rosinski, EEF specialist Chloe Butlin, the National Literacy Trust's Irene Picton, and a range of experienced practitioners, including MAT leaders, deputy heads, heads of English, high level teaching assistants, and school librarians. Through the three-day conference, speakers will explore a range of topics at the forefront of the current educational landscape, with sessions relevant for all educators and key stages. Visit Reading Solutions at readingsolutionsuk.co.uk for more information and to sign up for this free conference. Okay, so... Um, good to hear once again from our sponsors there and about that reading conference. And what can I say about Emma this evening? Fantastic. What a fantastic guest. What amazing ideas around supporting transition. And lovely to hear, you know, there are schools doing some fantastic work outside of the main transitions at year six to seven. Um, but, you know, if if you're looking for ideas uh, some brilliant advice there and particularly around why it's important towards the end of that conversation you know it's not just about what can we do but really understanding why we are doing those things particularly if you need to have conversations with other people in your school and explain you know the rationale for your decisions always good to you know know for yourself what is that why what am I going to get? What's the impact of doing these things? So thank you to Emma. She's been brilliant. And I said, especially not just on a Friday, but on the start of a half term. So moving on just to finish off the show um, this evening. I always finish with a well-being word for the weekend. And although we've been talking a lot about transition, um, this show and my previous one, I've actually decided to go with the word sameness. Um, and the reason I've gone with sameness, and actually Emma you know, pointed out that change is as good as a rest, but sometimes you know, we need things to be the same to give us that chance to rest, to give us that chance to recharge our batteries a little bit. Um, we live in a world that is, is very, very fast paced, whether that's you know, social media, the amount of connections, sometimes the expectations we have, which may be perceived, may, may feel very real. Um, you know, that we need to always be on. We always need to be responding, keeping up with things. And actually, you know, that, that is essentially constant change. What else is happening? What is going on? Um, fear of missing out. You know, that, that is very real for people. And that, that can often be linked to change. If somebody's got a new job, they've got a brand new house in a lovely location. And, and we kind of feel that. Um, whereas actually what we perhaps need is to just take that step back to slow down and keep things the same for a little while and um, if you if you can kind of consciously mindfully do that what it can really do is is just help to settle your nervous system you know this is this is biological stuff and psychological stuff that you know you you can support your own you know being with um, and actually, it links to what I talked about last time about grounding, actually, you know, getting yourself to a point where you can just literally feel the earth, the grass beneath your feet. Um, it's something that will always be the same. And it's it's about regulating our mood um, and supporting our well-being. And, and sameness you know, it does does a similar thing. It just 
helps us to, to know what to expect. Mentioned a few times already about cognitive overload, um, cognitive demand, and, and we don't have that so much if we keep things the same. If we, if we just focus on, you know, what can I do that I know what will happen? And, you know, there, there's lots of different things that that might, might look like. It could be that you have a hobby that you go back to time and time again because actually it's a distraction. It's something you can deeply focus on. It's something that, you know, just it gives you pleasure and, and it, you know, it doesn't have to mean anything to anybody else, but it means something to you. Um, it helps you feel comfortable and it helps you feel settled, which to me, that that's always going to be a good thing. And, you know, we're talking a lot about education and stuff. If we are regulated, if we are feeling calm, we have much more capacity to support our students in the best way possible. So, you know, if you're not sure what it is, you can keep the same. I would encourage you to have a think about, you know, what are you already doing that that works for you? And I you know I've mentioned hobbies already, but it can be other things as well. And a personal example is, well, I suppose the opposite of same is the idea of hot desking for me is just fills me with absolute dread. I like to have my desk set up with the things where in my mind they belong that that's where they go that's where they always will be you know my drink is on the right my microphone is on the left you know my key pot is um on the corner pens are over there it's just those little things that you know if i had to keep going to a different desk every day that would for me that would be something that caused quite a lot of stress because i wouldn't know where things are or even if they were there in the first place so you know, I say mentioned hobbies, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be those little things throughout your your life, your day, your week that you can reflect on and go, actually, that really helps me. And it might actually then be something that you can focus on doing more of. You know, if you know that, you know, you've identified, like for me, the desk thing, if you know that is the case, you can keep that in mind. It's something you can return to if there are times when perhaps you, you know, you are finding things a little bit tough. So um, just as I say, an, an invitation encouraging you there to, to have a think about what it is in our very fast-paced world in where it can seem that there's a lot of change um, and sometimes pressure. You know, it can feel like we're being pressured to change ourselves and to constantly be reinventing who we are and what we do. And actually, you know, we don't need to always be doing that. And a phrase that really, really rings true for me is the phrase, good enough is good enough. If if what you're doing is good enough, that, that's fine. You know, that, that is good enough. So, you know, we don't always need to be, I don't mean this in an Ofsted way, but outstanding. We don't always need to be the best. We don't always need to be striving for something new. We can just go, yeah, this is me. This is where I'm at. This is my house. This is my life. This is, you know, whatever. And that is okay. So I would encourage you, and especially as it is half term uh, about to start, you know, yes, you might be doing some different activities through this week. I think that's brilliant. But also, what is it that you can keep the same that is going to help you have that sense of calm and have that sense of familiarity? So, Thank you very much for joining me today. If you've been listening live, thank you very much for being here. If you've downloaded the podcast, again, thank you for doing that. Um, and thank you one last time to Emma, who was an absolutely fantastic guest this evening. Have a lovely half term, and I will be back in two weeks' time. See you soon. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.